Welcome to Earth, a love story. I'm your host, Robin Lassiter. This time on the podcast, guess who's back? Experiencer Jim Loki, who first made an appearance on Earth, a love story way back on episode 20, returns to talk about the stroke that he suffered while at the Archives of the Impossible Conference in Houston last year, and the fact that he used to be Jim the Grey, but has returned as Jim the White. We talk a lot about death, a lot about his miraculous healing, potentially facilitated by an ET of some kind, and the fact that I dreamed about that healing event. Mostly, I catch up with my good friend, Also, I want to welcome all of my new listeners. If you're just joining us, I want to let you know that you can hear me read my entire book on the first 15 episodes of this podcast. You can also support my work by buying my book, Earth, A Love Story, on Amazon, or by leaving a review there. You can also leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It seriously helps. Enough of that. Thanks, guys. And I hope you enjoy my conversation with Jim Loki. I wondered kind of what you wanted to talk about and if you'd be interested in processing that or talking about it, because you and I had a weird sort of shared experience around that, that we kind of alluded to each other, but I didn't go into detail because it was just a lot at the moment. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know what, what your angle was on that. Why don't you give like the context and talk about if you want, you know, if you're down for it talk about what happened in Houston when we were together for the archives of the impossible conference. And then I will at the appropriate chronological time in the story, I'll tell, I'll tell my part of it. All right. Yeah. So we were in Houston for the archives of the impossible conference. And I had a stroke. Okay. It started uh, unbeknownst to me pretty much the night of my birthday, which was Saturday night. And um, we had hung out after the conference at a restaurant and bar. And um, I had like a pint of Maker's Mark. Um, (laughs) Did you really? (laughs) Pretty much. Holy shit. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I kind of felt lousy the day or two before. But we had a long flight uh, delay, and it was just a pain in the ass getting to Houston. And then there was a lot of stress with getting the car that we tried to rent, and it was a headache, literally a headache. I, I'm just trying to do the context of how I was feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a headache uh, the day before. I had a headache, and I joked about being at the conference, you know, with a bunch of experiencers how we would be a prime target for a directed energy device Mm -hmm. and probably symptoms of the Havana syndrome, right? Yeah. Hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. So that night I left the bar and walked a block away to the hotel and was kind of fumbling around trying to get in the room. The key wasn't working and I went back and forth to the to the front desk a couple times to get new keys. I didn't realize it was just because the door was locked and I had to knock for mm-hmm. my wife to let me in. And I, I did feel kind of confused. And I went to bed that night and uh, woke up, uh, ordered breakfast, didn't feel like eating it, which is strange. And then... Um, I mean, I I went into detail on this on my podcast. You guys can check that out. Um, embarrassing facts, but uh, I had I had a little accident in the bathroom, and uh, you know, probably because of the Havana syndrome I was experiencing. Um, went to that day of the conference, and felt a weird feeling in my leg on my knee. Uh, just decided to walk it off Mm. and continued on going, uh, going home the following day and, uh, getting really stressed out with, uh, delayed flights and getting back to Boston and missing, uh, Monday morning's work, 
So uh, when, you know, describing just the stressful things that, you know, would give one a stroke, I got uh, into work Tuesday morning and uh, was trying to take notes and couldn't, couldn't, couldn't write. Uh, mm -hmm. I really couldn't talk to the person I was talking to. And uh, I was in the middle of a, a meeting with people face to face and just, uh, and th this was related to me after the fact, I don't remember this at all, but they said, you just got up and left. Wow. And, uh, uh, I remember going to the elevator bank and trying to press the button for the lobby and didn't, couldn't like, couldn't physically put my finger on that button. Mm. Didn't know what was wrong with me, but I knew something was wrong. So I drove myself, which was, a uh, now they, they told me afterwards I shouldn't have drove, but. I drove myself to the emergency room where I was expecting to wait, you know, because the city I live in, you know, you know, if you're not a baby that's stabbed or on fire, you wait a very long time before you're seen. Uh, yeah. They took me into triage, checked something, and were like, holy fuck, and they rushed me back. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in the ICU shortly after that. Uh, was there for a couple of days and uh, about a week later I was released to the care of a rehab and then was there for about a week and uh, and then uh, they sent me home for a uh, outpatient and during that time it, it was me figuring out like what went offline like what could I do mm. what couldn't I do and they were also just constantly giving me these neurological checks to see, you know, what the damage was, but it was serious. They, uh, they didn't think I was going to walk or be able to swallow food after seeing, uh, my scans, but I, uh, I, I came back really quick to the point where people that would see me were surprised that I was up walking around or that I wasn't alarmed. Like literally like they have alarms on me when I was, so I couldn't like fall out of bed and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, they were shocked when I, you know, wasn't just in a wheelchair and they would, the, they would say like, Oh, you're, do I have the right person? Like what is, you know, so they were surprised. And I, I, I'm getting, I'm getting all, uh, we clumped here on this one. Mm. I, I felt, uh, I felt good about that, though. I was like, yes, I'm getting better. Like, you know, don't tell me that I'm not going to be able to do things. Right. So I, it, it kept, it seemed like uh, I was, I was checking wins off down the line every day because it seemed like I was beating the odds. Well, I think what you want to get to, what, what was crazy is that I, I think I had uh, help mm. with my recovery. When I when I came home from the rehab, I was still pretty delirious. I couldn't tell time. Like, I didn't know, you know, if I looked at a clock and I saw that it said 3 o'clock and it was uh, 3 a.m., I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. Like, you know, you're supposed to be in bed, right? I didn't know what, what I had to do. That's a question that I, I have is, like, how – was there a part of your consciousness that was tracking this and being like, what the fuck or tracking the winds that, or did you have like metacognition oh, about all of it? Yeah. I, it's like pieces. Mm -hmm. If I try to remember it, it's like, um, like, you know, you're flying over an ocean and there's islands of, of information mm -hmm. scattered but you don't see them until you're right over them. And then it makes total sense in memory. You remember something. For instance, uh, I remember sitting in the hospital and my entire life I've been aware of and frightened of gray aliens. And when I was in the hospital, when I thought about it, I didn't have fear, but I felt like outside of myself. I didn't have my usual inner monologue. I was like without fear or I don't want to cheapen it and just say it was like, oh, ego death. Like it felt that disconnected, but I felt completely disconnected from whatever my body was before. 
I still knew who I was. I still knew who I loved and who my kids were. I, I knew all that, but I didn't, I didn't feel like I was me. And I had said this a couple of times to my wife. I said, Jim died. Mm. Um, like Jim's gone. This is something else. Wow. I hope that it's not like difficult to, to recount all of this. It's not difficult to recount. I mean, it's not, it's not like painful to, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, in, I'm in, I'm in awe of it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think about it often and I'm, you know, trying to arrange everything still, you know, mm -hmm. trying to piece together what was going on. Yeah. When you were telling um, your wife that Jim died, was that during that, like during the hospitalization or has that been since then you have that perspective looking back or was that like real time? It was real time. It was, mm -hmm. it was in the hospital and I think I've expanded on it. I think I actually believe it as a, as a, a, a wider thing. It's hard to say what is different and what changed spiritually. I feel invincible. Mm. Um, and that's different. I really didn't feel spiritual strength before, you know, I had a lot of fear of things, uh, that I couldn't control or didn't understand. And now it's like, I don't care. Like I'll go head first into it. Like come at me, you know? Yeah. It was like, I had that feeling in my twenties when I was frustrated with the phenomenon. And I said those things and it reacted to it. But then my reaction was just the fight and it didn't go well. Now, I don't, I don't think I'm afraid of anything. Mm. I'm afraid of going back to that state of delirium. Yeah. You know, I'm not afraid of dying. Uh, that is weird to say. Because, like, isn't dying, like, the worst thing ever? But I'm not. I'm not afraid of it. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm not looking forward to it. But when it happens, it happens. It's amazing. I... I don't know why this is, but I know that you said that at one point in the last couple of months, like in an experience or group meeting, I think. And ever since New York, actually, ever since, because we went to, we saw each other again at the conference, um, the Inquire Anomalous Conference in New York in December. And I left that conference and I don't know why exactly. But I became completely, I was actually, I was like in the cloisters in New York, walking around all of this Renaissance art and Marian statues and, and all of this. And I just became absolutely fearless. And I was like, I'm not fucking afraid of anything. And it stayed and stayed and stayed. And so when you said that, like, I know, I, obviously we came at it from completely different angles, but when you said that, I was like, like, I'm not fucking afraid of anything. <laughs> and it doesn't mean that yeah. it like keeps us away from death or that things become easy or that there's not suffering. Like, it doesn't mean any of that. I'm just, I just keep checking. Like, am I afraid? I am not. Yeah. Yeah. And I got I have to add to that. The New York, when we all got together, I felt like it recharged, mm -hmm. especially after, you know, having a stroke and going through everything that I've gone through to recover it was like breathing in air for the first time. And I felt normal to be around you guys and felt, felt great. Yeah. There's a weird magic when experiencers get together. There's a, there's a weird something. And especially like, I don't know what it's like with other groups, but our group is, is something special and it feels like home. It's just cool that there's an understanding and a shorthand mm -hmm. that you could just be yourself and it's totally understood how yeah. you're coming from. Right. And you don't know that I don't know that I miss it until I'm around it again, you know? And then it's like, Oh, this yeah. that's right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Jim died. How are you? Like, 
I want to hear the whole story. I want to hear it all play out, but I'm curious about how you're framing that now. I can't do this without a Lord of the Rings reference. Do it. (laughs) I came back. Jim the White. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. I feel that. How is your, is it an internal change? Is it external as well? Like how is your life different aside from the fearlessness? Everything is different. Music sounds different. I feel like the air around me, the what whatever the ether is around me isn't so thick anymore. Mm. I feel I feel like I can just I feel like I actually belong mm. in this like realm. Wow. <laughs> I feel like I don't know. It feels like I I like I could say like maybe I did die. Like maybe like this isn't the same reality that I was in before that stroke. Wow. Because it feels that different. Wow. That's amazing. Is there, it sounds, so it sounds like great, right? It sounds really great. Is it hard? Um, no, I, the things that were hard, I I've accepted, mm-hmm. you know, my mortality, uh, the fact that I have holes in my brain that, you know, I have to, be careful with uh, what I eat or I can die. Those things um, I've accepted, Mm -hmm. you know, the trade-off is that things are good. And how is, uh, how's Vanessa handling it? Does she see the difference? Oh yeah. Yeah. She, she's amazed, amazed, you know, I'm just generally healthier so that, you know, that helps things a lot, but you know, she, she's still really scared that I'm going to die. Mm. you know like she she deals with that every day yeah so that's also motivating for me to show that i'm good Mm -hmm. so tell me about the help that you think that you received and i'll tell you about my experience all right when i came home from rehab i uh yeah i wasn't like allowed to walk alone still i couldn't tell time i didn't know if i was coming or going literally Hmm. i was experiencing really bizarro dreams which um they told me is common with a brain injury even my roommate at the rehab was you know experiencing similarly wacky dreams and they were wacky dreams like uh just very intricate detailed uh for instance i was i dreamt an entire night of uh a toy guitar with little plucky strings, but the strings were all over the guitar, but like not where the strings usually are. They were all over the place and they sounded like a toy piano. And um, I spent the entire dream figuring out how to play a Tori Amos song that I know how to play on the guitar, but now I had to figure out how to play it on this toy piano guitar thing. Hmm. Uh, So, and then another one where I was a, basically honey i shrunk the kids small and there was a a lawnmower in a 1960s dad suburban neighborhood you know whatever that means yeah yeah. but it weren't my dreams they were they weren't like healthy right it wasn't my typical dream so i was just i woke up and i was like that was fucking bizarre my friends came to stay with me from new jersey uh up to massachusetts when i count out so it was it made coming home very easy and fun the day they left it felt like all right now it's you know now it's time to recover and you know get get out of this i went to sleep that night and woke up at a 45 degree angle suspended you know nothing nothing under me I was in a dark, uh, I was inside the craft that I've been in. Mm -hmm. It's dark, but it's not, it's hard, it's hard to describe, but I knew I was at a 45 degree angle. I wasn't, I wasn't afraid a being that I hadn't seen before, but I've heard of as a tall white was there with me and I was at ease because I recognized him as somebody I had known for a while. 
his face wasn't like the grays that I had seen before. It was more human like. Um, I was really focused on the high cheekbones. And um, he told me, um, matter of factly, and when I, when I say he, he talked to me, this is in my head. Mm-hmm. I hear him say, you know, you know, matter of fact, matter of fact, you know, we have to do this now. And a, uh, a white lit device or something about the size of uh, an oyster shell uh, started tracking around my head and just just going all around my entire head. And that's all I remember. But what stopped immediately was the, the wacky dreams. I immediately had the usual dreams at night. Mm. And I started my recovery at like full speed. I think I started reading. I could watch TV again, you know, and in, in, in the rehab in the hospital, I couldn't even have the TV on because I couldn't follow anything. And I, I don't know. It was, it was like somebody flipped a switch and I could do things again. You know, when I had first come home, I was thinking about my guitars. I love guitars. And uh, I picked, picked up a guitar and tried to play a riff that I had known since I was 13 years old. And it wasn't, it was nothing. Like I couldn't do it. Like I had, I could not play it. And my uh, friends are like, Hey, you know, like it'll, you know, you'll, you'll figure it out. It'll come back, you know, but I was shocked. Like I just had nothing of that guitar ability. Shortly after that experience, I, uh, was in the bathroom and I thought in my mind about how I play that. And I said, I think I could do it. And I just went from the bathroom over to the guitar and picked it up and played that riff. Things like that happened throughout the, like the following week. You know, I had no handwriting. I couldn't write anything. I was sitting in a doctor's office and had to fill out a lab sheet and I had my wife do it because I couldn't write. And then I was just sitting there thinking and thought, I think I could write. And I tried, I, I wrote down something, Mm -hmm. uh, little, little things like that. There were actually pretty big things. Yeah. Just happened. I will say to the being that I saw, I thought he was familiar. I thought I knew him. Um, he came across as an acquaintance and I didn't know if it really was him or not. I was like, if that's, if that's the guy I know, that's pretty fucking crazy. Mm. Like, is he really the human that I know? I don't know what that was about. Uh, I have since seen that person (laughs) and, uh, he didn't, you know, rip off his human mask Scooby-Doo style. (laughs) So I I don't know what to make of that. I don't know if that was just something to keep me calm or Mm -hmm. or what. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's like the 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 mystery ever remains trying to figure out exactly what it is. And if it's a one to one, like, are we experiencing this thing exactly? Or are these masks or overlays or. Is his. You know, I mean, there is a there's an idea that we don't fully incarnate. We don't like 100% of our souls aren't with us and we're kind of multidimensional and in different places and different times. And so, uh, was he true? Was it him, you know, and he was just working with you on another plane of existence that could track as well. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Tell me, tell me what your weird angle is on this. Yeah. Just that, um, I could probably look back and see the date because I know I I'm pretty sure I I messaged you something like I had a dream, you know, just just noted that I had a dream about you. And the dream was, I just have snippets of it now, but it was like in a kind of a shack in a forest, and there was a there was a gray 
alien, which I very rarely dream about grays. Very rarely. I've had one, one other kind of important dream about grays, but it was a gray and I don't even know necessarily that it looked like a gray. I just knew it was a gray. And um, it had some sort of like, I think I described it as like a hockey puck, like some sort of round, small thing. And it was doing something to you. In the dream, it felt very like chaotic and strange. And it like maybe it was windy or something. And I was, I think I was kind of worried about you. And I don't, I honestly don't remember a lot of details other than that, but I just remember like it, it was doing something to you and it had this kind of, I don't even remember a color, but kind of a hockey puck looking thing. And actually, as I remember it, I found this really weird, weird rock like ages ago that was, that was kind of shaped like a hockey puck, but it was white and it had, (laughs) it had something that looked like teeth kind of just that impression, not that it was actually teeth, but it just sort of looked like, like if a kid would draw teeth with these, with kind of lines going down and yeah. across. And that's kind of what it looked like it was just this little, little hockey puck looking thing that was kind of white and had, had markings on it. And uh, so my memory of this, and I could confirm it by going back in my phone was that I texted you and I said, I had a dream about you and kind of an ET dream about you. And I think that you said back like, yeah, I had that too. And it was just the timing of it. I didn't know what had happened. I didn't know that it was like that you'd had this experience, but I remember them being very closely connected in time. Do you, is that what you recall as well? Yeah. Yeah. It's it. That's pretty crazy. You know, your detail about it being gray, like, mm-hmm. but not entirely a gray. That's what really stood out to me yeah. about him. And of course, the the object, whatever that is, you know, similar in size. Yeah, that's, you know, I had heard after, after the stroke, it was, I mean, it was, it was just a couple of weeks ago, I heard the podcast. It was about, I believe, the Pascagoula incident where somebody described a matchbox shaped device coming out of the top of like an exam room. And uh, that was one of those things where you stop and go, Hey, you know, I've never heard that before, but what, what was that? And they, you know, he, I think they described it as a similar thing, like, you know, tracking or scanning around somebody's body. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It's just enough detail and enough corroborating reports right. to drive fucking crazy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. We hear all these stories and one of the common threads of that can happen as an experiencer are these healings, this kind of ET intervention, miraculous sort of healing. And I have my own story about that. And it's truly one thing to hear it. And it's another thing to actually experience it and be like, I don't know if you experienced this. I was, I'm just like a real experience with document doc, documentable. That's not a word. Um, it is now. It is now documentable. There's, there's kind of, you know, physical proof in the world after this experience um, happened and kind of undeniable. And yet part of me is still like fucking really that happened it's no, one of the markers that. in this constellation of weird shit that happens uh, yeah. to experience I, I totally get that because even with me i'm just like yeah oh, i'm just the statistical oddity that came back from this horrific brain injury yeah my experience of it on on this side was that uh vanessa reached out and let us know that it had happened and we were all insanely worried about you and um, people in the community were sending lots of healing and support. And Carol Vance, <laughs> our mutual yeah, friend, which, was like working on you. Yeah, which I I felt totally. Yeah, and I I, think I told you guys I wish I I wish I knew how to like make things with my hands because I just felt like I wanted to give you back something mm-hmm. that had some meaning like that. 
Um, cause I really did. I felt it. It's, it, it, it is one of the things that got me through those times mm. for sure. It's amazing to hear that. Cause we, cause you hear that, you know, that like this stuff works and is helpful, but of course at that time we didn't know your poor wife was like, so I'm sure overwrought and exhausted. And she was giving us it, tidbits and information as she could. But I do remember at one point, I, I think you were still in the hospital and I asked, I was like, is it, oh, should I send, should I text him? Should I just kind of like send him a message directly and let him know that we're all thinking about him? And she was like, you can, but he can't text. Like he can't my, type on the yeah. phone. And I was like, Jesus was fucking locked. Christ. My phone was locked because I couldn't unlock it. I kept just mashing whatever numbers couldn't do it. That's it's just, I mean, that's the, those are the details that I remember. Like, fuck, yeah. like you can't fucking push buttons on a phone or, and then as time went on, remembering, you know, hearing like, you know, he, I think you were talking at this point, but being like, I, you were sending me texts maybe, or like messaging a little bit, but saying like, I can't play music. I can't do the podcast. Like it's not, you know, and really feeling just this holy shit that this thing is happening. And then the next time I saw you, <laughs> like if you hadn't told us that any of that happened, we would just be like, Oh, there's Jim. He looks great. You know? Yeah. That's, and you know, similarly the people at my office think the same thing. Right. Right. They don't, yeah. They just, you know, think I took 15 weeks. Jesus. Uh, sit on the beach. God, 15 weeks. It's amazing. Yeah. It's just unreal. Again, we hear about these experiences, like having a near-death experience or going through something like this, touching the other world, coming back changed. And I'm sure you've heard, ton I don't know, are you like me? Did you Do you like devour NDE experiences? And I, I mean, I not all the time, but I, I feel like I have enough. Mm -hmm. You know, that the Netflix thing that Leslie Kane was a part of. Yeah. That was great. Uh, there were, there were, uh, what was her name? Elizabeth. Uh, that was at the second inquire anomalous. She has a, a really wild story of being hit by lightning. Oh, yeah, uh, so I know yeah. these things happen. Mm -hmm. I know these things happen, but it's even right now we're talking about it and it sounds insane to me. Right. That this is my reality now. Like I, I, uh, I'm one of those. Right. And we're kind of coming up on a year. We're not, we're not quite there yet, but yeah. Like when did the fearlessness set in? In the hospital. Wow. In the hospital, I was delirious. I was hallucinating. Mm -hmm. um, I had an argument with a nurse that never happened. I, I thought my uh, doctor had a like comical accent, just a bunch of dumb shit. I just stopped being afraid of my prior experiences with the phenomenon. When I came home, and I, I mentioned this on my podcast too. When I came home, my uh, I was with my friend, and we were sitting outside, and uh, she was showing my daughter how to make sigil uh, bottles. Mm. And I looked off to my left, and I I saw three uh, lights in the sky and one to the left side started moving to the left like away from the other two and i thought like oh that's okay like that's still here okay like and i felt mm -hmm. relieved but i i didn't feel fear usually when i would see things my first reaction was oh no mm -hmm. but when i saw it this time i i just I felt okay about it. And I actually looked um, to my right side uh, where my friend was sitting and she goes, did you see something? And I said, did you? And she said, uh-huh. So we didn't talk about it immediately, but afterwards we did. And she said that she saw something and right away she had the thought that it wasn't for her. Mm. Mm -hmm. so it's a shared experience <laughs> right. yeah it's a shared experience and it's and it's cool and 
that that is my friend Sarah, who is actually on the uh, my recent podcast mm. episode. Yeah, that's amazing. It's funny because I just interviewed my editor Suzanne Chancellor, and this episode is going to come out after um, her episode comes out. And she said something similar. She had a she had an experience, and and her husband said exactly those words. Like, this is oh. just this is just meant for you. And her reaction was Here. hilarious. She was like, no, we're going to fucking go look for it. Like, I don't care if it's just like, I want to go look for it. Um, but yeah, it's funny because those exact words um, were recently said to me as I was talking to Suzanne. Wow. Yeah. And what is that? Is that like, you know, that telepathically communicated to her and to, in Suzanne's case, Suzanne's husband, you know, this isn't for you. This is just for, for them. Yeah. And it's one thing, it's like yeah. you hear about, you know, it's like you hear about, <laughs> and then yeah, when it I, happens to I, you. Actually, you know what? I want to talk, about, if you don't mind. Yeah. I just had my friend Sarah on my podcast. Mm-hmm. It's great, by the way, I listened. Um, I, uh, I brought a clip. Please. All right. Let me just set this up a little bit. My friend who, you know, heard, that's not for you, for Jim is now a medium and you know when we were kids growing up she was into you know some weird stuff we you know her house was full of ghosts you know we messed with ouija boards but in talking to her in the last couple years she's she's an accomplished psychic medium who i was really excited to talk to Mm -hmm. but uh she had a she had like a really weird version of Zoom that it was kind of hard to get into. Mm. Right, so here we go. Self is strange and unusual. All right, let's bring her in. Uh, her Zoom is kind of old. Uh, let's see if we could do this. This is a this is going to take a group effort. What I need is to have everybody take a deep breath and relax. Clear your mind. I've turned the lights down and lit a candle. Let's close our eyes and focus on summoning Sarah. Sarah, can you hear me? Sarah, are you there? Sarah, if you can hear me, talk to me. Well, that's all you're supposed to do. What? I'm not sure. Hello? No? Nothing? Man, we should try our cell phone. God, there's something in my throat. Ah. Fuck. Sorry, are you there? Hello. Oh, it worked. It did work. Oh. Hey. Cool. Hey, how you Here? doing? We're good. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So when I thought about starting a podcast, mm-hmm. I thought about what what could I bring to the table, the conversation around the phenomenon, UFOs, aliens, all that. And I looked at the landscape you know we have really great podcasts um that ufo podcast is great uh down the rabbit hole ufo rabbit hole is great um exo academians his podcast is great um they're all hilarious <laughs> but there's not a real serious science-based <laughs> ufo <laughs> podcast out there so that's what i'm after yeah i can see that right that clip is a is a perfect example of that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, I don't know if we talked about this on the last um the the last time you were on my podcast, but we I again like in a support meeting in the experiencer group, you mentioned at one point you're like, I think I'm gonna be an experiencer comedian. And I was like, 
Yes. Like, fuck yes. That's exactly what we need. And like, nobody's doing oh, it. <laughs> yeah. And it was, it was another, it was another guy that mentioned um, a similar thing, like a ET standup. He said, uh, where his words and, and uh, I just threw my pen up in the air because I was thinking the same exact thing. That's right. And I remember. I could, yeah, I, yeah. I remember seeing you throw your pen up in the air. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause I, 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 you know, I'm just now getting started again. I've been sitting, you know, around this entire time since the stroke, um, you know, wanting to do this. And I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to other experiencers, you know, um, I have uh, ideas like the Dr. Stephen Greer drinking game, which is the <laughs> next time he does a long form interview. The drinking game is whenever he says that he read somebody into the secret program, <laughs> he drinks. Right. Okay. Also, um, this is, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a big scoop. Yeah. Give me it. I haven't revealed this to anybody yet, but I've been in contact with and getting this person to come forward on my podcast, a real UFO crash retrieval whistleblower. Really? Yep. Really? Yep. <laughs> cool. Well, I can't wait. I can't wait. Yeah. That's a tease. That's that is a tease. <laughs> well, I yeah, your podcast is great and it's hilarious. And in fact, the of course, I mean, I know you've only had a few episodes, but my very favorite episode was you um talking about the fact that you'd almost died. And like the Stephen Greer joke that happens in the first two minutes is some of the best laugh out loud experience or comedy yeah. that exists. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Your uh, episode about just recently was really excellent for the cringe factor. Thanks. Um, I'm happy that it exists today. Uh, I listened to your, one of your book episodes and it struck me like it's one of the few books. Um, I think, you know, it's you and Whitley that triggers something. It's not like direct memories, but feelings of like, like I remember who my inner child is. Like I remember mm. it, it stirs up something that is godlike and oneness and love. Those feelings that you are unknowingly always trying to recapture mm -hmm. in this world. There's flashes of it when I hear or read your book. Wow. There were flashes of the fear and terror in, mm -hmm. in, in the book and in, in, in communion, mm -hmm. you know, and that that's a real thing. And listening to your book today was really cool because it made me feel those feelings. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about that trying how can i articulate this and you really can't it's that trying to get back to the garden feeling mm. that it starts thank you that's uh, an amazing compliment and i think that that is like whatever my weird ass journey is part of my work is being in the body and feeling our feelings and that being an experiencer is about that experience that shifts our ontology, like shifts, like the world, you know, we have an experience and like everything gets, goes sideways for a minute and shifts. And it's that weird feeling in the body. And I think that that's important. Like, I really think that it's important that we remember to feel our bodies again. And so it's really cool to know that that's your experience of it and the inner child, like that's all my work. So it's cool to know that it's coming through in that way. Cause it gives me direction of, cause I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing, you know, yeah. <laughs> like for it, reals. It's just, <laughs> yeah, it's just happening. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the kind of magic when we have these experiences and go on these journeys, like it can't be, we couldn't have constructed it. You couldn't have constructed that, you know, having a stroke and a miraculous recovery and coming back as Jim the White. Who wrote that story? It's a good one, but you didn't write it like two days yeah. before it happened at the archives conference when you were drinking a pint of Maker's Mark. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't even think about that though. Like whether or not it was predetermined or written. I, I just kind of sit in awe of it yeah. and appreciate it. And that's relatively new, isn't it? Cause was there a time when you just sat in fear of it or annoyance? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, forever mm -hmm. uh, in fear of it, crippling fear to the point where I wouldn't even entertain trying to meditate because I was afraid of what might come through. Right. Yeah. You know, people doing uh, CE5 mm -hmm. is like Jeff Goldblum waving a flare at the T-Rex. <laughs> right. Like, like, no, don't do that. No. <laughs> are you, are um, you crazy? Don't do it. No, I, I go, I go outside most nights and, and I'm at peace with whatever's there. Mm -hmm. Same. Yeah. I had just two nights ago, I had something and I used to be terrified, terrified. And now it was early morning enough and I was getting up to let my dog out. And I was like, and I went outside. I would never go outside if I saw something through the window, you know, but this time I went outside and stood and, and watched it. It's like, what the fuck are you? The difference now too, is that I have like agency now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's, there, it's partially that they've backed off some, mm -hmm. like give you a break. I had that sense. Yeah. But now I feel more in control of times when I want to be open to it. And I, and I don't feel afraid of that, that wave comes over. Mm -hmm. I would never entertain the thought of opening myself up to it or mm -hmm. I used to be afraid of like, you know, Oh, is that the feeling? Is that the, the buzzing in my ear? Is that the, is, is it now Is it happening? Like that's awful beyond, beyond any fear you can imagine. I don't know. Cause it's now it's a complete 180. It's just, I feel maybe integrated. Mm. Maybe that's the, the thing. I just have to marvel and laugh because in, in what you just said, there were like five synchronicities from my day today. You know, oh. it was, yeah, it's just, that's just what it's like. It's just what it's like. I mean, yeah. I exactly talked earlier today about, about this stuff being integrated 10 seconds before you said it, heard the ringing in my left ear, like <laughs> those are just yeah, the ones the I can remember, yeah. but yeah, ear, wow. it's usually in my right ear, but this time it was in my left ear. So, oh, it's for, it's the left for me. Yeah, it it's funny though. We got into that conversation with my wife, even noticing mm -hmm. similarities that we have. Yeah, it's like kindred spirits to the nth degree. Right, right. It's just bizarre, and it's wonderful. And I don't know what to make of it, but I'm really glad to be on the side of it where everything is enchanted and miraculous. And I'm in awe of it rather than being afraid of it. It's pretty fucking great, actually. It is. Yeah. And it, it when people ask you, do you wish this never happened to you? And you mm -hmm. say no. And it's, it, you know, that doesn't make sense. It's like, oh, you don't wish you were trauma. You don't didn't want to be traumatized. Like right. what? But no, it it's all worth it. It's all, it's all part of the deal. This is what it's supposed to be. I love that. That's my jam too. You know, is like, we're not going to get out of grief. We're not going to get out of suffering. It's not, that's not the point. It's not the point. It's, it, it exists. It's here. Trauma is real. The body's reactions to trauma are real. And then we go through a process. And for me, there's like a million different ways to die and not die, but you died and didn't die and came back and now life is enchanted. And I just think there's something fucking to that. That's my work. Like die before you die so that life becomes enchanted and not hopefully with a stroke or something like that. I, you know, mine was mine. One of my biggest ones was the death of a relationship, which was the death of a timeline. Like the timeline died and I, and that me, yeah. that version of me died. And it was the biggest death I've gone through. And it was, it brought me through to something else and it still sucks. <laughs> I 
it's still too hot and too cold and boring sometimes and like uncomfortable. It didn't like fix the world, but it's like the res- the resistance went away, which made which makes life enchanted somehow. Yes. I hear that. Do you think that you could that that you heard that before your stroke? Do you think that this is new? It's totally new. Yeah. Yeah, it uh, yeah, the the stroke that event changed everything. Yeah. I mean, leading up to the stroke, I had I had a a new awareness of myself right with mm-hmm. the podcast because I had such a, a a great response to it and people were were reaching out to me saying how like it's made them really consider opening up about being an experiencer and mm-hmm. how freeing that is and it it felt heavy like I felt mm-hmm. I felt like that was a responsibility that was dropped on me that I wasn't expecting and I kind of struggled with it Jim, I remember but, that at the conference. I remember yeah. you being like, holy yeah. shit. And I was kind of sorry, but I was kind of flip. I was like, yeah, dude, this is what happens. This is awesome. <laughs> yeah, you're changing people's lives. And you were like, no, for real, I'm freaked out. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. But yeah, you were like, yeah. <laughs> which makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. My, my wife and I got like this ridiculous honeymoon suite in Cavalston <laughs> for the night. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> I was up all night, like talking about, you know, this kid's username, screen name, sent me a, a direct message saying, thank you. Like this is going to change my life. I'm, I'm telling my, I'm telling my friends all about this. And, you know, it just, it was heavy. You're like, don't do that because of me. <laughs> but it was, it was, it was, it was like heavy that you, I could have this uh, effect on somebody. Mm-hmm. And then you know, by talking to you and my wife, like I felt good about it and was like, oh, wow, this is, this is cool. Like this is addressing a deficiency that I've had socially, you know, my entire life. I'm pretty autistic. Mm. Right. And I can't deal with this shit. Right. But that, that pushed me through it. And I, I was like, oh, this is a, uh, a new lease on life. And I was like, yeah, you're doing really good. Like your professional life is doing really great. You have, you know, all these friends that are incredible. You know, you, you've really come into yourself here. And then I died. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't see that one coming, did you? No. Oh. Um, yeah, it's just fucking weird. And I'm really glad that you're here. And I'm glad that you died and didn't die. And I'm glad that you're fearless. Like I had, I was in the cloisters with a friend and I won't go into like the details of the conversation at all, but I was feeling like, should I be afraid? Am I, should I be afraid? Am I being like naive to not be afraid? And my friend looked at me and said, no, we're already dead. And I was like, right, that's right. There is truly nothing to fear. Like once you, you know, what, what else, what else you got? Yeah. Yeah. You're, I mean, you've heard that people that die say that, you know, there's nothing to fear in death, Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's meaningless. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) You know, even to me who, you know, I came close to being dead. I don't, I don't fear it. I mean, obviously I feel bad, you know, that my family would be left with me dead. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. You, you consider that, you know, right. that's part of the deal, but I've seen enough proof in my experience and, you know, the, my parents' death and others that I've been close to. And I've seen things that are impossible happen. I'm not afraid of it. It's more natural than anything we can do here. Yeah. 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 So I, I always make sure that I'm not like bypassing suffering. Right. And being like, it's great. Death is amazing. Like, of course, family left behind, or of course, like horrific suffering that happens on the planet. 
It doesn't solve any of that. So staying close to that like truth of suffering and also really claiming the enchanted world that exists on the other side of death. And that death is, I deeply believe that death is safe. And I deeply believe that we should do death practice so that so that we can go through the experience at least somewhat consciously and do something cool on the other side instead of get trapped in like a little eddy of our mind that's just like, you know, learning to play a different kind of guitar all night or whatever. Like there's different, there's things that can happen, I think, after death that can kind of take our attention um, away. And ultimately, regardless, I think death is incredibly safe. So we should just practice it because it's also like enlivening. It makes life, life, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. It gives um, context to life. Mm -hmm. It makes life alive. I'm, uh, I'm really happy that you're here and I'm really happy you're doing the podcast again. Next time I die, call me. (laughs) You call me next time you die. From the other side, don't oh. freak me out, though. You know. Oh, yeah, let me tell you about that. I want to have you on my podcast, uh-huh. but I need to do my homework and prepare the best interview you've ever had. Oh my god, I'm so excited! That's gonna be a good one. Cool. That would be. I would. I would absolutely love that. Whatever we got going, whatever this weird world that we've all found ourselves in, like in the experiencer group and this group of friends, and let's just keep doing it because something good is happening. I'm in. Me too. Thank you so much to Jim for sharing his story. To find the Experiencer podcast and listen to him tell his story about the stroke and about his recovery in depth, and also to laugh a lot, check the show notes. Thank you to you, listeners, and thank you so much to my patrons for supporting my work. I'm releasing the rest of this conversation with Jim on my Patreon. We talk about, among other things, his pop culture movie podcast, Retromania, where he and his friends review the movies that scarred us as kids. Think Never Ending Story, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. The link for my Patreon can be found in the show notes if you're interested in joining in there. Thank you also to Morgan Jenks for our beautiful musical soundscapes. For more information about my work or to book a one-on-one session with me, please visit honeyheart.com org.